It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Vicente Rafael, who, as you know, is about as well respected and well known as it is possible to be in academia. And we are really delighted to be able to host him in our modest brown bag series here at Yale. Um, many of you will know his justifiably famous works on the historical and cultural politics of the colonial and post-colonial Philippines, including modern classics such as Contracting Colonialism, White Love and Other Events in Filipino History, The Promise of the Foreign, and Motherless Tongues. He's also the editor of several important collections in Southeast Asian studies. And if you go visit the Duke University Press website and search Vicente L. Rafael, um, you'll pretty much see that he is the central core of their post-colonial studies series. Um, really in some ways uh, brings uh, Duke's reputation in that field uh, into fruition. Now, me personally, I, I first learned of Professor Rafael's importance when I was a PhD student at Cornell, when I had the privilege of taking courses with Benedict Anderson and James T. Siegel. And although Ben and Jim are rarely impressed by anyone, um, they would always speak in reverent tones when they would recount the stories of their greatest student, Vicente Rafael. Perhaps I would say the only of their students who could encounter their charisma without being shocked into submission. The rest of us, when we would meet Jim and Ben would become sort of silent to use, a, to use the way Jim might phrase it would be, we'd become like corpses in the face of their charisma. But Vince, it seems, has been able to harness the energy of their teaching without becoming devoured by it. Today's talk offers a sneak preview of a forthcoming book on the politics and aesthetics of the Duterte regime. It's entitled, The Sovereign Trickster, Death and Laughter in the Age of Duterte. And that book will soon be published by Duke University Press. Please join me today in welcoming Vicente Rafael for his talk entitled, Duterte's Phallus on the aesthetics and on the aesthetics of authoritarian vulgarity. And I will share the screen. And once this sh screen is shared, uh, he will begin his talk. It's really a pleasure to be here, uh, even if it's just a virtual kind of meeting. I, I notice many, many friends and uh, uh, colleagues that I haven't seen in a while. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> thanks so much for coming. Um, and again, thank you for, for, for facilitating this, Eric and Chris. Uh, and, and the rest of the students and, and, and staff at, uh, in fact, at the uh, Southeast Asia program. <clears throat> As Eric mentioned, uh, this is a talk that spun out of one of the chapters of my forthcoming book. Uh, and uh, uh, if you would like during the Q&A to sort of expand uh, some of the uh, arguments I make in this, in this chapter and, and connect it with everything else I've, I've been trying to figure out in the book, I, you know, I'd be... I'd be more than happy to. So uh, let, me, let me begin by, uh, first of all, by locating my paper. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, things that uh, if, if, you've, if you've sort of even briefly been following events in the Philippines, uh, since the election of Duterte, uh, one of the things, uh, two things you notice. One is that uh, he, he remains enormously popular, despite all the sort of arguably disastrous uh, and, and, and near genocidal policies he's adopted in the Philippines. And the second thing is that <clears throat> uh, he's also sort of remarkably vulgar. Uh, and and uh, uh, people have tried to sort of establish the connection between his popularity and his vulgarity, his obscenity. <clears throat> and I, I, in this paper, I, I sort of try to try to connect the two as well. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, asking a very basic question, which is, what are the sources of this symbolic authority? Uh, how has he managed to occupy such a central place in the imaginative life of Filipinos, both supporters and critics alike, as well as those at home and abroad? Uh, <clears throat> and one of the ways in which uh, the president lays claim to both national and global attention is through his stories and jokes. 
I mean, he's a consummate storyteller. Uh, and it's, so the, the humor comes as part of the stories that he likes to tell. Uh, he's widely known for his irreverence and body humor that constitute important elements of his governing style. Uh, and it's really that that I, uh, def, uh, towards the end, I, I want to connect to the, the connection between his storytelling abilities and his governing style. His stories reveal a reliance on invective <clears throat> and an obsession with obscenity. He also makes frequent references to genitalia, his as well as those of his critics, to the delight of his listeners. He revels in what uh, the philosopher Ashil Mbembe calls an aesthetic of vulgarity that has the effect of establishing a relationship of conviviality between himself and his audience. What results is a kind of intimate tyranny, much of it centered on the tales of its phallus as it encounters the world. So for example, and here we could start with the next slide. Uh, for example, in his campaign events uh, in April, 2016, uh, Duterte addressed uh, the Makati Business Club, which is about as sedate and as conservative a setting as you can imagine, made up of wealthy businessmen in the country. Rather than talk about his economic policies, though he regaled uh, the audience with uh, stories about his use of Viagra. So he says, for example, um, well, I'm separated from my wife, annulled, so I'm useless. Uh, so, so I'm not useless, I'm not paralyzed. What am I supposed to do with my goddamn thing down there? Let it hang forever? Well, there's no drama going on. I drank Viagra and then it stood up. Oh, let's not kid ourselves. I am giving it to you raw. I thought you were all the same age here. Uh, so, so he starts with a story, right? Uh, and, and here you can see where Duterte shares with men of a certain age uh, and considerable influence, a story about his experience uh, of emasculation followed by rejuvenation. Thanks to appeal, he regains his hard on, the material evidence of a phallic power that he thought he had lost. Laughter ensues as he discursively shows to the men a part of himself that should have been hidden. His obscenity consists, consists of making the private public, reaching below to connect with those above. It is this sexual politics from below that binds Duterte uh, to these men, along with a sprinkling of women uh, who join in the laughter. Together they share a common fantasy about the authoritarian phallus as something they can imaginatively access and the prospective pleasures of a drug-induced erection beginning with that of Duterte's. But as we shall see in other examples below, the pres presidential phallus comes across not only as an instrument of pleasure, but also as a sign of terror. In another campaign stop at a large sports complex in Quezon City around the same time, 20, this is around uh, early 2016, Duterte tells a story that reverberated around the world. And some of you may have remembered this uh, uh, particular tale. Uh, he says that while he was a, a mayor in Davao in 1989, there occurred a bloody prison siege in Davao City. Among the dead was one of the hostages taken by the prisoners, a 36-year-old Australian missionary, Jacqueline Hamill. According to Duterte, she was repeatedly raped by the prisoners along with other women hostages before being killed. But rather than evoke pathos, the sight of Hamill's corpse steers desire in the mayor. And if you can have the next slide, please. All the women were raped during that first assault uh, uh, because they retreated the bodies they used as shields. One of them was a corpse, the Australian woman lay minister, Tisk. This was a problem. When the bodies were brought out, they were wrapped. I looked at her face, son of a bitch. She looked like a beautiful American actress. Son of a bitch, what a waste. And son of a bitch here is putang ina. It's a very common Filipino curse. What came to mind was they raped her. They took turns. I was angry because she was raped. That's one thing, but she was so beautiful. The mayor should have gone first. Son of a bitch, what a waste, Sayang. Um, okay, so. Uh, so much for that slide. Um, here, Hamill's rape and death is used by Duterte as a step for, as a setup for a joke about himself, more specifically, about uh, the arousal and frustration of his lust. He sees her dead body and her beautiful face and he feels that he should have been the first in line to assault her. 
Instead, he comes too late and isn't able to come at all. It is his failure to assert his claim on the woman's body that is presumably taken by his audience as the object of hilarity. Seeing her dead body fills him neither with rage nor grief, but with a desire that cannot be fulfilled. He is unable to discharge his authority, as it were. The horror of the scene is just displaced into a story about a mayor lamenting the failure of his phallic power. Rather than the erectile victory celebrated in the first story, the second ends with a punchline, Sayang, what a pity, preceded by the cuss word, Putang Ina, son of a bitch. <clears throat> but all is not lost. The tortoise disclosure of desire unfulfilled and phallic authority undercut, uh, undercut produces a payback. The audience laughs and their laughter compensates him for his lost power. It, turns to, it tur returns to him, it returns to him, both the pleasure and the authority that deal, uh, that, that dead prisoners and the woman's corpse had deprived him. Unable to pull rank, the mayor is nevertheless rewarded with the people's recognition of his narrative performance. Reports of the story drew sharp rebukes from feminists, human rights advocates, and the Australian and US embassy, as well as many other quarters. But among uh, most of the electorate, his popularity soared, horrifying his critics, but delighting his supporters with his pungent shamelessness. Duterte's bad language and obscene stories were crucial to propelling him uh, to the presidency. In tracking his jokes, we can see a set of obsessions built around the question, who gets to own the phallus? Who gets to wield, uh, who gets to wield it and for what purpose? Here, the phallus should be understood less as a biological thing synonymous with a penis as a symbolic weapon for asserting autocratic authority and patriarchal, patriarchal prerogatives over women and men alike. <clears throat> like guns, cars, or wealth, the phallus can be used to impress and to threaten, to unify and to disperse, to induce pleasure, but also to coerce submission. Duterte routinely threatens to castrate his opponents, even as he repeatedly reveals his generous endowment. Used to avenge imagined hurts and shore up fragile ego, Duterte's phallus proved effective in shutting down his opposition. The presidential phallus, however, is far from being an unassailable force. As we saw in the rape story above, it can also be blunted by other men and women whose death frustrated Duterte's assertion of his privileges. Indeed, Duterte is notorious for joking about rape as a way of reasserting his ability to police women's behavior and enlist men into affirming the sexism that buttresses his authoritarian imagination. Hence, when critics point out that contrary to his claims, crime in Davao, while he was a mayor, had actually gone up, especially rape, he retorts that wherever there are beautiful women, there will be plenty of rape. Along the same lines, he also spoke approvingly of men who had, quote, the balls to rape candidates for Miss Universe in exchange for facing certain punishment. Women are raped, not simply because they are women for Duterte, it is because they are, quote, unquote, beautiful. It is as if their beauty is a challenge that has to be faced down, a provocation in its proper place under the rule and the service of the phallus. The philosopher, Kate Mann, uh, has a very interesting and useful description of misogyny. Uh, and perhaps, uh, let me just cite it here as a way of framing Duterte's own particular uh, uh, misogyny. She says, quote, misogyny is what happens when women break ranks or roles and disrupt the patriarchal order. They tend to be perceived as uppity, unruly, out of line or insubordinate. Misogyny isn't simply hateful it produces social costs on non-compliant women. Think of misogyny then as the law enforcement branch of a patriarchal order. That makes for a useful if rough contrast between misogyny and sexism. Whereas misogyny upholds the social norms of patriarchy by patrolling and policing them, sexism serves to justify those norms largely via an ideology of supposedly natural differences between men and women with respect to their talents, interests, proclivities, and appetites. Sexism is bookish, misogyny is combative. Sexism is complacent, misogyny is anxious. 
Sexism has a theory. Misogyny wields a cudgel. Close quote. In joking about rape, Duterte, and here we can go back to me. In joking about rape, Duterte upholds patriarchal norms and sexist attitudes by wielding the, quote, cudgel of misogyny. And that cudgel, that cudgel is the phallus, at once combative and anxious, always wary of challenges and eager to assert itself. One particularly disturbing story that illustrates the law enforcement role of misogyny involves Duterte encouraging soldiers when confronted with communist female fighters to spare their lives, but to shoot them in the vagina. Quote, there's a new order coming from the mayor. We won't kill you. We will just shoot your vagina so that if she has no vagina, then she would be useless, close quote. Shooting them in their vagina was in a way taking away what made them women. It was their punishment for taking up arms and defying the state. It amounted to, quote, castrating those who challenged the patriarchal norms integral to the exercise of the state author state's authority. Hence, we see how Duterte's misogyny is directed not at every woman, but at particular women who attempt to seize the phallus for themselves, daring to go against this political and sexual authority. And, and conversely, women who <clears throat> Uh, affirm his phallic power are, are, are uh, richly rewarded for that reason. Now, Duterte's phallic power is directed, however, not just at women, but as we saw above, at other men as well, to make sure that they too fall in line. For example, while campaigning for uh, uh, senatorial candidates during the midterm elections of 2018, Duterte extolled the size of his penis in order to set him apart from the, quote, ugly candidates running in the opposition. While one's character is important, penis size, he claimed, was crucial. Had God given him a small penis, he continued, he would have gone to, to the church alt altar and cut it off, saying, son of a bitch, is this all you have given me? Encouraged by the crowd's laughter, he then recalled how he would walk around naked in the hallways of the YWCA as a young man, while everyone else covered up with a towel, he went about proudly displaying his junk, junk. The other residents would look on in admiration. Quote, and uh, here you could uh, show the next slide, please. Quote, they tell me, son of a bitch, Duterte, you're so hard. When I was young, my penis almost looked up to the sky, moving the microphone upwards to make the point. Its head would almost reach his belly button. I'm very thankful to my father. At least he let me out into the world highly equipped, close quote. He finishes by recalling how women at a local bordello were shocked at the sight of his member. They ran away. They said, referring to me, we don't like him, that skinny guy. He won't stop having sex, close quote. Uh, and so much for that slide. In his youth, Duterte claims he literally stood out creating a vivid impression among both men and women. While men envied his penis, women, however, ran away in fright. Wishing to have a phallus like his, the other men acknowledged Duterte's possession of his power precisely for the respect it arouses in other men and the fear of sexual violence it steers among women. Merging masculinity with misogyny, Duterte's phallocentric politics is central to his authoritarian imagination, using the image of his penis to put both men and women in their putative places. This brings to mind Helene Sixou, quote, within the phallocratic apparatus, women are subordinated and defined by lack, while men are given the grotesque and unenviable fate of being reduced to a single idol with balls of clay, close quote. We can further see Duterte's phallocentric politics at work in the following example. In a speech in 2019, Duterte reacted to the rumors that he had a kidney transplant and was dying from colon cancer. The target of his ire was Kit Tatad, a former cabinet minister during the Marcos regime and a major figure in the ultra conservative Catholic sect, Opus Dei. In his newspaper columns, he had written about Duterte's illness and frequent absences from public view, suggesting that he was on the verge of dying. Duterte responded by saying, and here we can go to the next slide, 
uh, this Tata, he said, uh, he said my day is coming, that I was confined, serious, in and out of the hospital with colon cancer. Nearly every day he was going on and on. You read the newspaper. I mean, how unfair can you get? Every day, even I started to believe him. So one day, one day I had dressed to take a shower. I held my, without my underwear, I held my anus. I smelled it, smelled like shit and not some other dot, dot, dot. Next slide, please. Can, yeah, he said I was already dead. So I hit back. I said, this Tata, you Tata, son of a bitch. I would admit it if I were sick. You son of a bitch, you have serious case for 30 years of diabetes. You, your dick can no longer. And then he raises the microphone uh, to the laughter and applause of the audience. When you have diabetes, 30 years drops the microphone. No more, I said, let me borrow your wife for one night. I'll let her hold my body, go on. <laughs> Your insult hurt a lot. Eh, you son of a bitch, you're asking for it. You said I was rude. Well, son of a bitch, that's true. You said I was no statesman. Well, that's true. Okay, so, uh, so much for that slide. Um, now, let's break this down for a second. The president has always been particularly sensitive about rumors regarding his health, despite the fact that his various illnesses have been widely reported and takes particular umbrage at those who suggest that he is close to death's door. Duterte takes his revenge in the form of returning Tata's putative insults with interest, but he takes his time getting there. He recaps the rumor, acknowledging its power to compel belief through its repeated circulation. Uh, and it, it's, this, it's this recapping that's part of the storytelling uh, sort of style. To make sure that he doesn't have colon cancer, he talks about poking around his anus and smelling his fingers, reassuring himself that it smelled of shit rather than of some other cancerous odor. Discursively exposing his anus, he also exposes himself, not only to the possibility of being sick, but also to the possibility of being duped. Assured that his anal stink is nothing out of the ordinary, he goes on the attack. Punctuating his remarks with crisp invectives, he points out that it is in fact Tata who has been ill with diabetes for many years and as a result can no longer get his utin or dick up. The consummate performer that he is, Duterte makes a point of illuminating this with the use of the microphone as a prop. He lifts it up and down to show the contrast between what he can do with his penis and what Tata can no longer do with his. He goes from exploring his anus to scrutinizing his penis, linking the two as signs of his good health. And to clinch his case, he asks to borrow Tata's wife so he can verify the hardness of his erection as compared to the flaccidness of Tata's. His mouth and anus come to the aid of the presidential phallus. Together, they marshal a barrage of obscenities that meets with the laughter and applause of the audience. In this way, Duterte effectively unmans his opponent. Tata's stories depicted Duterte in a state of bodily crisis. Feeling aggrieved, the president hits back, showing that in fact, he remains in command, beginning with his control of the narrative and his abil ability to re reverse its target. Returning the insult with interest, Duterte draws a third person into the scene, Tata's wife, who is pictured as complicit in Duterte's revenge, in effect, cuckolding her husband with the invitation for her to grasp his thing. I have one last story, and perhaps it is the most revealing instance of Duterte's power of storytelling. And here it's a little bit extended, so I hope you'll, you'll indulge me. Um, and it's, I, it's always kind of ironic when I do this paper, so because I talk about Duterte's storytelling by telling my own stories. Anyway, uh, this story of being, uh, it, it is this story that he's totally obsessed when it comes back, oh, com comes back to over and over again, which is the story of being sexually abused at around the age of 14 by an American Jesuit priest uh, during confession. He often returns to the story as a way of casting aspersions at the Catholic Church that has been critical of his human rights abuse. So there's a very strategic uh, reason for him to go back to the story again and again. Folded into his story, however, uh, is another, his sexual abuse of their household help, which he later confesses was in fact a fabrication. 
Here, what we see is a double confession in the story. The Turte to the priest and to the audience, and a double assault, the priests on the Turte and the Turte on the maid. The two acts of violation turn out to be intimately related, whereby the priest's assault on the Turte becomes a means for the latter's domination of his audience. He has frequently told stories on, he has frequently told these stories on various occasions uh, in his usual mix of Tagish, Bisaya, and English. Uh, below, uh, what I provide, what follows is a translation of a composite version of this, this, this one long continuous story. So let's start with a slide. Uh, now in Ateneo, uh, who here is from Ateneo? If you are from Ateneo, on Friday, it's communion, confession. That's automatic. And during confession, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And what is your sin? Well, it is standing up because you are fondling my goddamn prick. While confessing, the priests fondle our balls. So when you confess, they ask you, what are your sins, my son? Uh, I was a freshman. Uh, what was the sin of a freshman? Next slide, please. I, I, come on, I, 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 I is not a sin. We do not have the whole day. Speak up. I went to the what? I went to the room of the maid. Why? I lifted the blanket and I tried to touch what was inside the panty and I was touching. She woke up. So I left the room. Where did you go after that? To the bathroom. Why? Guan, father, Jung, the usual. Well, father, uh, the usual. Next slide, please. What is the usual? Allah muna, you know. Okay. So you went back and I tried to insert my finger, Father. Then I, there was hair and, and it was wet. And did she wake up? No, Father. She was closing her eyes, fast asleep. Oh, sabi ng pare, the priest said. And I went to the bathroom again, fa Father. Again? Yes, Father, twice. Oh my God. Say five Our Fathers, five Hail Marys, because you will go to hell. Next slide, please. That is the explanation behind the finger story. The priests would urge you to tell more sins. What sins could first, second, and third year students commit? Wolf whistling women was the only sin that we committed. But Father Falvi, he was always urging you to tell him more sins. Come on, come on, give me your sins. Do you know why? Because the longer you stay there, the more he can fondle your balls. And there were many priests. They would just divide the students among them. If you believe the story that I fingered a woman, you're crazy. I only said it because the priest was insistent that we tell him more and more sins so we could stay kneeling while he squeezed our balls. Son of a bitch, that's the truth. Uh, so much for that uh, slide. So we, we can go back to, to me. Um, so what do we make of this? Really, I mean, it's a really interesting story. Now, many of the Turta stories are arguably confessional to the extent that they are about exposing what usually stays hidden, bringing to light what otherwise remains in darkness. The subject who speaks is also the subject who is spoken about, as she reveals the story of their sinful acts to a priest who in turn dispenses penance in the name of God. As the mediator of divine forgiveness, the priest exercises an inordinate amount of power over the penitent, registering the penitent's debts and prescribing the penance with which to cancel these, uh, a subject, of course, that I talked about in my earlier work. However, in Duterte's telling, the very act of confession is subverted. It is no longer meant to seek forgiveness and acknowledge the priest's authority, but precisely to ridicule it. Duterte reveals the priest's concupiscence, showing how confession becomes a vehicle, not for forgiveness, but for clerical abuse. Confession breeds obscenity rather than divine dispensation, making for an uncanny encounter between the priest and the penitent. What emerges in the experience of confession for the penitent, and here a young boy, is the return of the repressed in a familiar form, the predator as father or the father as predator. From the perspective of the boy, the father's demands appear autocratic. He cannot be refused. His lust for the boy requires that the latter must stay longer in the confessional, making up sins in order to satisfy the priest. 
To comply with the priest's demands, Duterte claims he made up a story about fingering their housemaid, then masturbating twice in the bathroom. He evokes a circle of touching while the priest fondles his genitals. Duterte talks about fondling himself on the genitals of, uh, fondling himself on the genitals of the woman as she sleeps, then subsequently fondling himself. His story connects these improper connections into a sequence of submission and mastery that yields pleasure and laughter. The trauma of sexual abuse for Duterte at the hands of the priest is transmuted into the excitement of probing the maid's genitals, then mastering, as it were, his own. This mixture of fear, shame, and excitement is registered in Duterte's stuttering reply to the priest's insistence that he tell him more and more. I, I, he says, as the priest holding his balls, fishes for more, demanding, and then, and, Duterte's confession climaxes, as it were, with the two trips to the bathroom to relieve himself. In the end, the priest waves him off with a few feckless prayers, assuring him of eternal damnation. Rather than a site for the, for, for the contrition and uh, divine forgiveness, confession here is converted into a kind of pornographic machine for the reproduction of sadistic male pleasures. The Turta submits to the clerical abuse, but turns that submission into a story about his mastery over the maid who remains apparently innocent of his violation. His exposure and disempowerment by someone above becomes the condition for over conditions, become the conditions for overpowering someone below. He thus reverses his position from being abused to being the abuser, from a position of submission to one of domination, from one of fear to one of satisfaction and release. But only at the expense and through the exploitation of a subordinate other. But what of the audience? Feminists, human rights advocates, church hierarchy, and other critics of Duterte uh, typically reacted with anger. They decried his misogyny of making light of his sexual abuse as consistent with, the disregard, with his disregard for human rights. Others were scandalized by his indecency and filthy language, his lack of delicadeza or civilized behavior. In other words, they read Duterte's obscenity in the way that he had meant it as an unremitting war on social conventions. Judging from the transcripts and the videos, however, those who were present at his speeches reacted differently. They doubled up in laughter. They applauded his stories, laughed at his jokes. But why would this be? Now, Freud once posed this question. When we laugh at jokes, what are we really laughing at? Are we responding to the technique of joke telling or to the content of the joke or to both? It is never clear, he says, to the extent that jokes like dreams are fulfillments of the same wish to evade repression. Quote, the joke will evade restrictions and open sources of pleasure that have become inaccessible. It will further bribe the hearer with its yield of pleasure into taking sides with us without ever, uh, without very close investigation. Reason, critical judgment, suppression, these are the forces against which a joke fights uh, in succession. Now, the political significance of jokes, the fact that they go against the grain of the reasonable and the normal would seem to make the valuable resources for the oppressed seeking to overthrow the weight of authority. Mikhail Batin further argues that medieval celebrations like the carnival and modern literary forms like the novel are sites for this upending of hierarchy through satire, satire, disguise, and social inversions. The high is brought down low, and the low is elevated, especially parts of the body and its functions. Writing his audience, Duterte is, alike, is like a smuggler of illicit goods, promising forbidden pleasure and overturning repressive strictures. He says that they would have wanted, he says what the audience would have wanted to say, but could not. Their laughter could thus be read as signs of their identification with Duterte's efforts to find a way out of his suffering at the hands of the priest with a tale about abusing the maid who nonetheless remains unaware of her violation. They delight in his resistance 
and at his bumbling attempts at mastery that leads to some sort of self-recovery. Decades later, when he tells his story, he is no longer a boy, but the president of the country. Occupying the heights of power, he is capable of commanding attention wherever he goes and whatever he says. Duterte's obscenities feel subversive, but subversion in this context is in the service of an autocratic end where laughter produces an intimacy between ruler and ruled. The vulgarity of his language positions him as a kind of rebel, inviting others to join him in his assault on bourgeois sensibilities and norms. But it comes with the condition that the audience must submit to his narrative. Only he can tell the stories and expect, expect their laughter. The reverse is never possible, as no one, as far as I know, jokes with Duterte in public. He expects no narrative reciprocity, no return with interest, but only a kind of passive acceptance of the surplus of stories he gives you. There is thus nothing democratic in Duterte's humor. Instead, the pleasure that the audience gets from the jokes is intrinsically linked to their willingness to participate in the imaginative violation of others, especially women. Whether he seeks revenge or release, Duterte's tales seek to assert his phallic power over his enemies while simultaneously subordinating and overpowering his audience. In looking at the narrative structures of his jokes, we see how it, how it hinges not only on the classic techniques of joke telling, those of condensation and displacement as in dreams, it is also productive of a hierarchy of listening, whereby Duterte as the teller monopolizes the time and the language of telling. As part of the audience, you have no choice but to wait for him. And he is always late, always late. Uh, and then listen to him, take his time, unspooling his tales. Unable to leave without drawing his ire, you remain a captive audience. Jokes then become a way of establishing his authority. He exposes himself, renders himself vulnerable and risks dissolving his authority, but only to recover and reassert his mastery over the scene of exposure. This dialectic of disclosure and domination allows him to forge a tyranny of intimacy, extracting your consent registered by your laughter. Humor is just a means of playing out his anxiety while assuaging his fear. Vulgarity is stylized and obscenity performed to release the audience, audience's inhibition at defying conventions. But this is bogus and deeply conservative since it always comes with the price of submission to the Duterte's authoritarian imagination. While laughter creates conviviality and community, it is always shadowed by violence and fear. Duterte recreates in every story something of the tone and texture of his primal scene, the dark confessional where he is held captive at the hands of an American priest. Indeed, his performative shamelessness today may be read as the unfinished struggle to master his fear of the father predator as he attempts to take on the latter's power for himself. It is precisely that same phallic power that he seeks to grasp and wield when he addresses those who considers critical of him, such as women and lesser men, and especially abject figures of criminality like drug dealers and users. Recklessly cussing at them, he lusts after their deaths brooking neither dissent nor opposition. And, and, then, and. Thanks a lot. That's it. Thank you, Vince uh, Raphael, for a fantastic talk. Um, we'll take a moment just to um, use our hand clap functions. Um, uh, this is really quite wonderful. Um, so we will now open up to a question and answer period. Uh, I will moderate um, the, the Q&A here. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'd like to ask you to um, use the hand raise function if possible. And if that's not possible to uh, turn on your video and wildly wave your hand so I can try to see you. Um, but that doesn't always work because I can't see every face at once. Um, so let's get started. Does anyone want to start us off with the first question? Yeah, so, you know, what I find most curious is this tremendous popularity that Tuterte continues to have. Do we know 
Is that gendered? Do women support him as much as men? Um, you know, as far as I can tell, uh, it, it, yes, uh, the, the popularity holds as much um, across genders, uh, as far as I can tell. I mean, of course, there's there's all kinds of nuance, and you know, but these surveys are are really difficult to 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 uh, uh, figure out. Uh, but but uh, uh, both anecdotal and survey results seem to suggest that uh, the Duterte remains. Uh, popular and there was there was a survey late last year uh, which put his popularity as far up as ninety one percent ridiculous amount uh, and, you know and it, it hasn't really gone down despite his uh, uh, mishandling of the covid the covid crisis and 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 the sort of failed rollout of of vaccines and so forth uh, he just I mean just, and, and part of it is because the opposition is also so weak. Uh, the opposition hasn't been able to offer uh, an alternative narrative, much less better jokes uh, than Duterte. So he, he, for that reason, I think he remains uh, astoundingly, astoundingly popular. So, yeah. Just a quick follow-up. I mean, it seems that some of, there's a kind of release of a, from a sense of humiliation quite often yeah. when you have this kind of reaction, yeah. reactionary humor. And yeah. um, I, it's, I mean, from my time, you know, in living among the signs in, in Mindoro, there was uh, systematic humiliation by the educated and by the church and by, you know, the, the kind of targets that Trump also has yeah. similar uh, targets here. Absolutely. Um, and it, yeah. that, that kind of class humiliation would seem to override the, the gender. Um, Right, the, 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 as, ma as many women feel humiliated by the elite as men do. And yeah. if the, yeah, it's like owning the liberals in this country, if yeah. he upsets the educated classes, then that's, that's enough. Yeah, and, and the other complicating factor here is the church. Um, yeah. so, so the source also comes from, from church hierarchy. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Thanks for that great question and answer. Um, we have a question from Paul Sarno. Then after that, it will be John Seidel, Asmus Rungbu, Amy Chang, and Ubert. I, I thought there was a time when he called uh, President Obama, quote, a son of a whore. Yeah. Did a translation problem there? Or what exactly did he say? Well, you know, the, the term he uses is putangina, which is the most common, literally puta. Poor, right? Yeah. Uh, so people tend to translate as that. But I mean, in the case of Obama and others where he uses that term, I mean, you could easily translate as motherfucker, you know, which is the other common way of, of referring to him. Uh, and of course, it's always laced with a racist uh, connotation, especially when he criticizes black leaders. There's always a racist uh, undertow to it as well. Yeah. And when he did he call Ambassador uh, Goldberg? The, that Jewish ambassador? Yeah. Uh, it, not, was the yeah. reaction to that? Yeah, not only Jewish ambassador, but a bakla, which is to say a, a gay, uh, a bakla, which is to say gay, gay ambassador. Gay uh, ambassador. Yeah, well, what's yeah. that about? Well, I mean, I, I mean, Goldberg was, I mean, as far as I know, was Goldberg gay? Was, was gay. He was, he was huh. out. Uh, but uh, Filipinos sort of used that against him. And with Duterte, his relationship to uh, homosexuality is it, it's a little bit complicated. He's both homophiliac when necessary and homophobic uh, when called for. So he could do either of both. So he will flirt with, uh, for example, a gay audience uh, and even claim that at one point in his life, he was probably gay. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and would say things like, well, I'm really for gay marriage because I think people should be able to marry whoever they want. But then at another point, use gay slurs to mm -hmm. attack his enemies, right? Uh, call attention to the size of their butt and what you know what they do with it and blah, 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 blah. So it's, it, it, he's very deceptive in that sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks, we have a question from John Seidel. Yeah, thank you, uh, Eric. And uh, really nice to see you, Vince, and to get a Hi, taste Dan. of the, the, the forthcoming book. A real pleasure. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, sort of a, if you could sort of follow up on what you were saying in response to Tom Gibson about the church. 
Um, you know, if we think of uh, Bakhtin's argument about that Rabelaisian laughter, the, mm -hmm. the irreverence is kind of productive of, of, of something politically that challenges authority. Um, clearly, the church is, is somehow very strongly in the mix. And it's worth perhaps noting that Kit Tot Tot is famously a, mm -hmm. a member of Opus Dei. Right. And, and I wonder that there are also the comments, you know, that Duterte made about the Pope. And even Obama, one could think of Obama as a rather pious, you know, mm -hmm. kind of persona. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Duterte's predecessor, uh, uh, Aquino, although, you know, promoting a reproductive health act that yeah. uh, the church opposed was also a kind of churchy mama's boy, uh, mm -hmm. Ateneo educated and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. So that's one question. The second question is um, you you use that, that sort of classic phrase, uh, I think, which which I've seen in other contexts, like in, in Sweden, when, uh, when people talk about populism, there's, there's a book in Swedish that's something like, we say what what you're feeling, that, that mm -hmm. sense of, mm -hmm. of the, uh, of speaking what people are really thinking, but, but are not allowed mm -hmm. in polite society to express. And, and the pleasure, the, the vicarious pleasure of that transgressive speech act and, and behavior. And that, that seems to be something which scholars uh, of, of populism um, see in many contexts. So I guess I, I'm curious whether you, you might be tempted to extrapolate from Duterte for other populists. Like, mm -hmm. I think there was someone in recent memory in American history, but I, I can't really remember who, <laughs> who, who that might have been. I think I, I, I blanked it somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all wish we could. Um, I, I, first of all, the, the question of the church, you know, the church remains as one of the staunchest upholders of a certain kind of moral authority in the Philippines it has a long history of of uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, crit critiquing political figures, you know, all the way back from the Spanish colonial period uh, to you know most recently the Marcos regime, and and then again Duterte. So the church has sort of positioned itself as the moral voice uh, that will uh, criticize Duterte, especially his war on drugs, uh, his uh, his pronouncements on on women, uh, his violation of human rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and since, since the country is largely Catholic, uh, they, they do continue to enjoy a certain amount of influence. And Duterte has done something very smart, which is he's sort of done an end run around the church and called them on their corruption, which is every, it's kind of like a public secret. Well, everybody knows the church is corrupt, but then no one will talk about it. And so what he's done is he's, he, he's, he, he's capitalized on this public secret. You know, he's criticized bishops for having cars, for having mistresses, this and that. Uh, and then, of course, there is this deep down sort of primal story in his background of being abused that uh, I, I'm almost certain many people uh, share uh, and comes at a time when, of course, there's this huge explosion of, of revelations. You know, that I, I guess this would be the, the Me Too version of the church abuse, right? Uh, kids being abused and so forth. So, so it, it comes at a particular conjuncture, particularly historical conjuncture, where the church is ripe for being critiqued. Right. So that's one thing. Uh, and Duterte is just the man to do it because, of course, what's, what's the church going to do, right? Uh, they, they can condemn him to hell. And he says things like, oh, I'd rather go to hell because the women there are more beautiful. You got to heaven. You know, the women are ugly. What am I going to do in heaven, right? So, uh, you know, he, he has a comeback for everything in that sense uh, that, that people think about but would never, ever, uh, for one minute, say in public. Uh, the second thing about, about uh, your question about humor uh, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, think about the guy you didn't want to, whose name you did not want to <laughs> mention. I mean, Trump uh, became very popular mostly because of his involvement with mass media. And one, and one of the things that, for me, one of the most memorable uh, things about Trump is he was very much involved in, in, in wrestling. And, world, and I'm sure you've all seen the video of Trump wrestling, uh, doing these fall moves, uh, uh, with, with Vince McMahon. Uh, and it, it's that kind of, of wrestling aesthetic, which is braggadocio, humor, defying convention, uh, a, a kind of uh, exorbitant display of phallic masculinity, uh, which, which allows uh, you know, certain kinds of people, certain kinds of men, and also women, I think, to revel in things that uh, are otherwise censored or forbidden. 
I, I think that these are crucial elements of a certain kind of reactionary, reactionary politics. Uh, and and uh, the, the pleasure of fascism, if you will, the pleasures of fascism are not to be downplayed uh, because it's, uh, it's something that's, that's, that permeates. I think it's something that permeates the culture and then coagulates and crystallizes around certain pronouncements of certain figures. Uh, and then they become, they become these celebrities, right? So, uh, so I, th I think it's interesting to think about that. There's a, certainly, and, and, and in this book, I, I, have, I do have a chapter where I compare the Turte with Trump precisely around the question of, of uh, humor, uh, this kind of repressive humor, so. Thank you. Uh, next question from Asmus. Before before we ask the question, I just want to note that we have uh, Professor Rafael has agreed to stay till about 1:20 today. So I think we can make it through all the quest the questions listed in the chat there. But um, just do be mindful of the time as we go through that. Go ahead, Asmus. Oh, thanks. I'll try to be um, concise because I'm. I was really taken with your um, your analysis, and I was. Uh, many interesting parallels to make to, uh, in contrast, to make to a figure like Najib in, in Malaysia. Um, but I was also really wondering about what kinds of female figures feature in Duterte's stories and what kinds of patterns are tied to that. Because it strikes me that there's a quite different uh, tenor to the way he speaks about his violation of it's imaginary violation of the maid and the sort of almost celebration of the violation of the uh, Australian uh, woman in the other story. Yeah. And and so I wonder, because like, at least where I've done field work in, in Malaysia, like all sorts of stories about rape and, and sexual violation would always be um, related in some way or sort of touch upon themes of spiritual danger of witches, and especially uh, the always fascinating figure of the Pontiana. So I was wondering what kinds of figures are present and what kinds of, or even if ideas of, of witches and, and witches sexual danger are also involved. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. As far as I can tell, uh, he doesn't delve into these uh, sort of uh, supernatural figures for women. Uh, Duterte's stories are sort of uh, pretty secular in their telling, as it were. Uh, and so, uh, I, I mean, the Malaysian stuff sounds a lot more interesting in many ways. Uh, but Duterte doesn't, doesn't dip into this. Why he doesn't, I, I'm not sure why. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure if you dig deep enough, there'll probably be some kind of resemblances, family resemblances to, to these different ways of of uh, uh, sort of figuring uh, femininity and uh, femininity out of place, because that's always what's at stake, right? It's, it's always the female figure out of place and how you deal with that. That's always an invitation. They're too beautiful, they're too ugly, they're too wild, they're too rebellious, whatever. So this, this idea of the female out of place is always an invitation for Duterte to sort of step in and say, well, I'm gonna put her back in place. You know, which I mean, arguably is the substance of misogyny uh, that, that Kate Mann suggests in her in her uh, book. So, yeah. Uh, next question from Amy Chang. Um, hello, thank you so much. I had a related question about your final anecdote, which, um, like pretty much everyone else, I'm sure, I heard the first time in the news and had like a really strongly negative reaction to. But um, I was surprised. Uh, listening to your analysis, it really opened up a lot of the vulnerabilities that are mm -hmm. present in that story. And I wanted to ask about a few more things in particular. Um, for instance, how precedented is it to be open about clerical abuse or like child abuse uh, for like male figures, politicians, or just any other celebrities? Um, and then the second thing was, um, I was curious about like the positioning of fabrication and innocence in that story because he says like if you think I really did it then like you're crazy of course I didn't and he explains that he was telling the story sort of as a survival strategy like when he was being abused as a, mm -hmm. a child to please this priest but also to sort of like it seems like as you were pointing out with the circle of touching like he's 
trying to tell the priest that like what the priest is doing to him is a sin by positioning himself as a sinner and saying that he's touching someone else. And therefore, like, if you call this, like this masturbation of an unwitting victim a sin, then you should recognize that what you're doing to me is a sin. And like, each time he goes to the bathroom, I assume to come, it seems like he's trying to like, bring the tale and thus the experience to a close so that the abuse will be over. But like, it in each case, like lasts longer than he wants it to. So he has to like, continue telling the story again so that he can get them to the payoff. And in that, I sort of hear an accusation of the audience as well as like, you're crazy if you think I've done any of these things at all. As Asmus pointed out, like the two violation stories we heard today are both imaginary violations, mm -hmm. proposed violations that have been fabricated. Um, so just, yeah, I was hoping to hear more about your thoughts there and maybe how like what the position of the, the innocent woman who's unaware of the violation that's happening is or like in the previous case of the Australian missionary like the woman who has died and so never could experience his yeah. violation which yeah. is like clearly constructed to be imaginary. Yeah, yeah that's that that's a great point uh, and, and uh, now you make me think about the connection between the dead woman and the woman asleep both of whom remain innocent uh, of, of their violation and I think this is again typical uh, of so much of the Turta stories, whereby uh, 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 his violation is compensated by a story, rather the violation that's visited upon him, in this case by the priest, is compensated by the story of his performance or his desire to perform a similar violation, but to uh, figures who then remain passive and therefore innocent. So in other words, it's as if he's saying he wants to exercise power, but at the same time, he uh, uh, claims to be innocent of the consequences of that exercise. So that's, that's one way to read it. The second way to read it is, and again, I don't get as deeply into this as I probably should, which is that uh, you assume he's been traumatized. And the question of trauma, of course, is that trauma is never resolved, right? Trauma thrives in repetition because of its failure to fully represent what's actually happened. So in the case of the Turta, he likes to tell the story of being traumatized by the priest uh, precisely because he can't quite get over it, right? It's something that goes on and on again. In that sense, it probably resonates with the traumatic experiences of his audiences too. That's what they share. What they have in common is their inability to transcend their trauma and therefore to be condemned to repeat it. But uh, the, the payoff is the fact that it's repeated but at the expense of uh, certain figures of power, in this case, the priest or whoever it is that's, 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 that's traumatized them. Um, and there's a sort of interesting connection with his obsession with drug killings. I mean, you know, when, when you hear him talk about addicts and killing, I mean, he, basically it's the same thing. I wanna kill as many of you motherfuckers as possible, right? I'm not gonna be happy until everyone's dead, right? I want to kill, 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 right? So it, it's, it's this, again, this repetitiveness, this inability to be able to sort of find closure uh, and, and, and to return again and again to the situation of wanting to violate uh, without end uh, at the same time to maintain that he is saving the country by killing addicts. Uh, and in that sense, uh, sort of maintain a certain innocence, even a certain nobility in what he's doing. So it, it, it's, it's uh, it, it's again this dialectic of of, of uh, disclosure and domination uh, that he's thrown back into as he tries to repeat uh, the same thing, the same discourse, the same stories again and again. And this is what substitutes in case of Duterte. This is what substitutes for policy. He doesn't have any policies. His only policy is to act out, as it were, uh, his his trauma. If if, if you want to, say. I mean, that's a, li a little bit simplistic, but. I, I mean, I think if, if you wanted to do like a psychopathological analysis of, of what moves this guy, I mean, I think that's part of it. Thank you. Um, and then if I could also ask like a brief follow-up question. Yeah. I was wondering if you'd noticed any um, patterns in his language use for different parts of his story setups, because you mentioned he speaks in Taglish, yeah. he speaks in English. And are there like, does he reserve a certain language for like certain punchlines or like for certain setups or yeah. when he's like building towards the climax? Yeah, he likes to speak in, in Bisaya, Bisdak, 
Bizdak is his first language, and and some of his most some of his most vulgar uh, and and more, more colorful anecdotes are always in Bizdak. Uh, the ta Tagalog is his second. Actually, English is his second language. Tagalog is his third, and ta Taglish is probably his fourth, right? And so when he speaks, he tends to he, sent, he tends to to navigate through those different uh, kinds of, of of languages, uh, and and it's the the like the, the vaginas shooting the communist rebels in the vagina, which is you know, so horrific, you can't even contemplate it. But he likes to tell that in Bizdak. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Hubert uh, Leonard Toralitsa. Uh, hello, good afternoon and good morning here in the Philippines. So Hi. my question is, uh, my my. My argument is this because I have read about Duterte because I'm trying to write a poem about his fascism because I'm a creative writing student from the Philippines, from UP Diliman, sir, if you're aware of or course, if you yes, know, yes, yes, yeah, yes, because yes. I have read about you, you're from Ateneo, if I yes. if I read it correctly. So uh, I have, uh, uh, Duterte has been diagnosed or was diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. So what do you think? Uh, Duterte loves to boast about his penis. So is there any studies or theories why he does this all the time? And one thing, uh, he's also diagnosed with a uh, pervasive tendency to demean, humiliate others and violate other human rights. So what do you think about that, uh, sir? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in some ways, this paper is about that. It's about reckoning. With, with these other diagnoses without completely accepting them. I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't mean the paper. In fact, I, I don't mean the book to be reductive in that sense of, you know, everything can be traced back to his pathological or narcissistic condition. But I do think that, that uh, it's impossible to talk about the third day or it's impossible to talk about uh, sort of these fascist figures without invoking uh, some of these psychopathological conditions uh, that, that seem to run like a thread uh, through many of them. Uh, the, the other thing, and, and this is also, actually this, this thing about the Duterte's humor is part one of a much longer chapter on his, uh, what I call the presidential body. Uh, kind of like a, a, a tribute to, uh, what's his name? The, the president's two bodies, uh, what's, what's the name of the guy who wrote that? Um, uh, do you remember? Bon, uh, it Bongo and Senator Bato, sir? No, 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 no. The, 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 the political theorist who wrote the president's two bodies. I, I can't remember. Anyway, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure the political scientists around here will know. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so the second half of the paper is actually about his, his uh, frequent references to his illnesses. He likes to talk about his illnesses. He likes to talk. Nobody else can talk about his illness, but he can. Now, he'll talk about his Berger's disease. He'll talk about his, his uh, possibility that he has cancer. Uh, in other words, he likes to talk about his own mortality. Uh, and his own frailty, in the same way that he likes to talk about the abuses that he's encountered in the past. So I, I, these, are, these are ways in which Duterte, I think, materializes uh, his own condition uh, as, as a way of, of uh, sort of anticipating criticisms from his, from his uh, opponents. He's too sick to rule, that he's got all these problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He'll admit to them and then say, well, so what? You know, uh, and, and then and then he will wax uh, pathetic, I and mean, he will he, he likes to invoke a certain kind of pathos. He, he, he thinks, well, I can't do everything. I'm probably going to die. I'm probably going to go to hell, and so forth. And again, it's a way of sort of invoking a certain kind of pity on the part of his audience. So mm. these are two sides. On the one hand, he, he he likes to joke and he likes to be abusive, and he likes to be obscene. On the other hand, he will admit to his own frailties and his own mortality. Uh, a, 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 as a way of anticipating uh, criticism, criticism from his audience. So, sir, uh, any follow-up, sir? Uh, do you think Duterte uh, say that to emotional blackmail the whole nation? Oh, w without doubt, without doubt. I, I think Duterte's policies of the drug killings has has resulted in what I call a government government of fear. Right, and, mm -hmm. and again, this is part of the book, is that how all these contributed to a certain governing style where fear is at the center right, uh, of, of everything he does. So. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, the next question is from Orvin M Mallory. Orvin, go ahead. Morning, Professor. Um, I was asking this question like in relation to uh, the Southeast Asian politics and culture seminar that um, I'm with Professor Harms as well as some people in this class. Um, I remember one, like this talk really reminds me of um, one of the earlier readings that we did on um, uh, Ben Anderson's Japanese power or the idea of power in Japanese culture, specifically um, that one, um, one of the sections where um, uh, Anderson uses a really remarkable anecdote about um, the succession crisis of like a Japanese, mm -hmm. um, a Japanese yeah. King, yeah. Uh, the dead king's manhood standing erect and on yeah. top of it, yeah, you know that one? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, I was wondering like, so, you know, knowing you as a student of Anderson, like, you see, do you see like this whole foul, like was that part of your inspiration in well, writing this, um, yeah. in writing about Duterte? And I was, to follow up on that, like um, as Professor Harm said, like um, to ask you about how would you rewrite that piece as a Visayan idea of power? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I don't know about that. that that's, that's another story we could talk about later. But uh, it, well, certainly, you know, Ben, ben has been an influence, but but I think much more has been the influence of certain feminist theorists who've talked about uh, uh, sort of uh, phallocentric or phallocentrism. Uh, and and uh, that's, been, that's been more important in this case. I, I, in connection to that, I remember in graduate school taking these classes in uh, pre-colonial Southeast Asia with people like Oliver Walters and various other people who some of you probably remember. And they would talk about the lingam and they would talk about the phallus and there would be no connection with the sort of gendered politics and the sexual politics of pre-colonial Southeast Asian uh, sort of practices. And I always used to think that's very strange. I mean, you're basically talking about representations of you know, male members as it were. Uh, but, but, but you can see how something like Duterte and Duterte's uh, wielding of the phallus uh, is in some ways very Southeast Asian. I mean, harks all the way back to you know, pre-colonial pre -colonial power, uh, pre-colonial notions of power, uh, which I don't make explicit in this paper, but I don't think it, it's such a stretch to make that connection, so, yeah. Thank you. We have a question from Daniel Yonto. Hello, and thank you again. It was a really interesting talk. Um, actually, thank the you. first words I, I learned in Tagalog over in the Philippines was joke long. And I think it's an interesting aspect of their culture. Yeah. But I also was in uh, Manila and the provinces. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that the jokes were different in each place. So I was curious if you found that Duterte's stories differed based on yeah. where he gave them at. Um, no, they were pretty consistent. Oh, that's they were pretty consistent, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, there are always variations. Uh, I, I, and, and, and lots of improvisation. I remember once uh, watching him administer an oath of office to newly appointed local uh, uh, leaders. You know, just a ceremony that they, they come to the palace and uh, they all take their oath of office uh, and the person always does this. And he comes in and, you know, he's, he's, he's famous for sort of being, looking disheveled so you know he's got his barong which is the formal dress but he's got the sleeves rolled up and he doesn't say good morning he doesn't say hi how are you he says well you know i'm not feeling that great i think i ate something bad i had to i had diarrhea uh the other day and uh and now i'm really itchy my whole body is itchy and then he calls on one of the women uh who was about to take that says can you come over here and scratch my back i mean this is like Apropos nothing, right? He doesn't, no ceremony. It's just like, can you scratch my back right here? It's really itchy, right? And of course, everybody's giggling because, wow, president, you know, wants you to scratch his back, that kind of thing. Or, or he'll give a talk in front of overseas contract workers in Korea and he'll pull a woman and he'll say, oh, what about giving me a kiss? You know, and they're all like taking selfies and so excited. And, and of course, everybody else is, is outraged about this. And, but yeah, he's, he thinks nothing of it, right? Uh, 
and uh, my favorite quote is, you know, he, he, he'll greet overseas contract workers returning from Saudi Arabia, and he'll say, well, it's too bad you guys lost your job, but you know what, I can give you a job, why don't we go kill addicts, let's kill addicts, you know, that would be a good job for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, joke line. <laughs> <laughs> We originally had a question from Roderick Gullum, but he sent me a note saying his question was already asked and answered. So we'll go straight to Jim Scott. Hi, Jim. Can... Jim, you just need to unmute briefly. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Good. Hi, Jim. Uh, hi, Vince. I can't wait for the book. Um, uh. So it's exciting to get a glimpse into it. I had a, a, a rather simple question, um, and that is um, the use of the word joke. Uh, your stories don't sound like jokes. And there, it's a raconteur, it's a sort of personal history with yeah. all of the edges that you point out but it's not the, at least the kind of, maybe I'm uh, looking at it through two Western eyes of a joke with a punchline and a sort of suspense and so on. Um, and so it, it strikes me that what Duterte is doing is maybe something other than a joke that we need a kind of special category and that therefore it's a little odd to sort of put it in the Freudian joke, right? Uh, category, right? Um, anyway, um, what are the other ways in which one might think of what Duterte yeah. is doing? And the, uh, it also occurred to me to wonder in, for ordinary Filipinos, um, mm this kind of talk, would it be confined to men drinking? Um, would it, what, what kinds of social context would this kind of storytelling be confined uh, were it not a kind of presidential um, repertoire? Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. This, these are the kinds of stories men and some women would tell uh, around, you know, drinking sessions, for example. Uh, and uh, so it's not unusual. Uh, what happens though is that those drinking sessions are usually circles, closed circles. Right. And it's, it's very rare that they, they, they come, come across uh, much more publicly. In a, in a way, you, you could argue that the tortoise storytelling has uh, sort of uh, sort of created this has nationalized, as it were, uh, the drinking circle, right? Uh, which used to be very local, very small, very intimate. Uh, he's he's turned an intimate gathering into a very public uh, sort of uh, situation. The second point you make is extremely interesting. Are these jokes properly? properly uh, sort of thought of, or is there something, is another category that we can use for it? Uh, it? You know, I've struggled with that. And one of the things that I use, as you can tell from the title of the book, is tricksterism, right? I mean, and I call, I, I refer to Duterte as a sovereign trickster, uh, as a trickster figure, uh, which, which probably would be, again, would connect to a more Southeast Asian context. Uh, and, and the thing about the trickster figure, as you know, is it's very widespread in the Philippines. It's very widespread in Southeast Asia. There isn't a single uh, Southeast Asian country that doesn't have some, some figure of the trickster. And the trickster is a very, it's a very uh, sort of uncanny or very canny figure, I should say, that combines uh, aggressiveness with a certain kind of attractiveness that is funny, but also cruel. Uh, that is predatory, but also uh, in some ways subversive. In other words, all these different characteristics that we associate with Duterte, you can find in the trickster figure, which is very different, say, from the trickster figure that you might have in Native American uh, uh, sort of contexts. Uh, uh, but in the Philippines, the trickster figure is, is omnipresent. 
Uh, and I think that that's what you get with Duterte is, is not so much the concept, well, he is a storyteller, yes, that's true, but not so much a jokester, but more of a trickster. And my use of Freud is really an attempt to, uh, in some ways, uh, get at the politics of this tricksterism of this jokester, because I, I do think that Freud is still, I mean, it's, whatever criticism you might lodge against him, I, I still do think that he was very, very much uh, keenly aware of the power of, of, uh, uh, of not just storytelling, but of, of, of humor. Uh, and it's very interesting because I, I hadn't read jokes in the relationship to the unconscious for years, for decades. And when I read it, I was surprised. I think something like 80% of the jokes are anti-Semitic. I mean, they're all Jewish jokes. You know, and he revels in telling these 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 these, these Jewish jokes, uh, and and uh, I mean, it would really it really struck me as unusual. So anyway, that that would be that so tricksterism, and then this idea of of sort of elevating a certain intimate acts of convention defying exchanges to a national level. Thank you. Um, we're approaching our 120 mark. Um, and so I think I'll gracefully bring it to a close here. This has been a really dynamic talk followed by a, a really dynamic Q and A period. Um, so I just wanna thank you for that. Before we say goodbye formally, you were mentioning drinking circles. So I thought I yeah. would take a, take a moment to um, announce the, the next brown bag in, in two weeks. Uh, on March 17th, which will be about uh, the melancholic play of alcohol drinking Lisu men on the China-Myanmar border. Oh. Um, so those of you who are interested in this topic, please please join us. Yeah. With that yeah. said, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just, just one more thing about this, this whole question of, of drinking and intimacy. Uh, I, one, of the, one of the chapters in the book talks about the problem of intimacy and the making of community uh, and, and as it relates to uh, Duterte's uh, 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 anti-drug program. You know, as, as, as some of you might know, one of the ways in which Duterte, uh, Duterte's policy works is through what he calls Operation Tokang. That is to say, uh, he has the police in conjunction with local officials build a list of actual and suspected drug users and drug dealers. And these, this list essentially becomes the kill list. And the question is, how does he develop this list? Well, he does so because everybody knows everybody else in the community. It's through intimacy that you have the development of community. <clears throat> so the very conditions for creating community become the very conditions for exposing it to this sort of ongoing danger. And for this reason, rather than an imagined community, <clears throat> rather than imagine community that Ben Anderson you know, famously talked about, what you get in the Philippines is what I call an autoimmune community, a community of autoimmunity, you know, where the community uh, in order to come into being actually enacts the very things that endangers it from within. So, uh, and, and I think that is the tragedy. That is the tragedy and that is the, the horrific sort of consequences of having someone like uh, Duterte, uh, uh, you know, uh, do this authoritarian rule. It's not the first time, and it's not going to be the last time. But with Duterte, you have the, the most dramatic manifestation of this autoimmune community. So that's that's maybe a, a way to end this. <laughs> that's a brilliant way to end yeah, it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so just join me, everyone, in thanking Professor Rafael for this fantastic talk. I'll stop the recording now, and then uh, we can just linger to say a polite goodbye.